Hello and welcome everyone. It's the inaugural edition of The Breach's election coverage. I'm Rob Rousseau here at the beautiful The Breach Studios here in downtown Montreal. Uh, it's very, very exciting to be here. This is going to be part of The Breach's election coverage that's going to be primarily focused on the debate on September 9th, followed by the election itself on September 20th. If you want to watch those broadcasts, make sure you subscribe to the YouTube channel. That's where those streams are going to be taking place. Um, it's a really exciting project. I'm thrilled to be here. And coming up, I talked to Mi'kmaq activist, writer, and lawyer Pam Palmiter. And let's get to that interview right after this. And now we're here with Pam Palmiter. She's a Mi'kmaq lawyer, professor, writer, and a breach columnist. Pam, thank you so much for joining us. It's our inaugural uh, broadcast at The Breach for election coverage. We're excited to have you. Uh, thanks for joining us. How are you doing today? Oh, thanks so much. I'm really pumped. I'm pumped too. I'm glad you're, that you're pumped. Um, let's, let's get to this, uh, this conversation, Pam. I'm really interested to hear your, your input on this. Um, as everyone knows, obviously, just a few short months ago, uh, by these, these discoveries of mass graves outside residential schools, uh, it seemed for a moment like this was something that was going to spiral into maybe some kind of a movement to uh, really confront the past of this country. And it doesn't really seem like that has materialized uh, as much as it seemed, may have seemed like a couple weeks ago, does it? No, not at all. And this isn't the first time that's happened. What was dominating the media headlines just before the last election. It was the report of the National Inquiry into Murder to Missing Indigenous Women and Girls, which found Canada guilty of not just historic genocide, but ongoing genocide. It was like a, a, a significant finding. And then what happened? Oh, sorry, we can't talk about it. We're in election mode, which means caretaking mode. And then it just died. And, and it's the same thing here. I mean, this will be many thousands of unmarked graves in addition to the known thousands of children who died horrific deaths in those residential schools was capturing everybody's attention, not just the media, but Canadians and organizations all over the country. Petitions were being signed. People were doing marches and rallies, like all, all attention on this the fact that Canada has not fully addressed what happened in residential schools, boom election, and we're back to talking about pipelines in the middle class. I mean, it's beyond imagine that we could be in that kind of scenario where we're now talking about the middle class. Yeah, I mean, you mentioned that report on missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls. I mean, when that when that was released, that was really one of the an eye-opening moment for me, and I think a lot of other people. It was a very grotesque moment in this country to see the priorities of our media class. After this report was released, I, I remember very distinctly that the kind of main conversation that was taking place in the media at that time was this kind of pedantic argument about the word genocide and what that means and whether that's appropriate. And it was very, very, I think, uh, chilling away, in a way to, to see the way that our media class reacted to this really disgusting report. And we're seeing the same thing, as you mentioned. Um, and you also mentioned we're in election season now. Um, is any party really like meaningfully addressing this this issue? Is anyone really meaningfully addressing uh, the, the history of this country and uh, talking about actual like a path forward to actually re achieve some kind of justice with this? Or is it really, you know, we've seen the the rhetoric from the Liberal Party. We know that it's a lot of words and not a lot of action on this and many other issues, frankly. But is anyone really addressing this issue with the the, the seriousness that needs to be addressed? I think if you look at the platforms. There's bits and pieces everywhere, but I have a real problem with headline platforms, that what gets into platforms are what's in the headlines. So if this election, the big issue is water and residential schools, that's what gets in, but you're not really dealing with issues of genocide or land back or or police racism, for example. And then the next election, it'll be whatever else is in the pipe, you know, in the headlines. It could be, you know, the war in some country, and then that's going to be the platform. We we've really gotten away from what is comprehensive government and leadership. It can't just be about here's what's going to get me elected. Here's what's in the media headlines. Here's what's polling. Like I want to see that someone can actually govern for everybody, for all instances. And that you don't call a snap election to see what people think about COVID-19. Come on, you were elected to govern no matter what happens. And, and that's why none of these 
platforms actually hit the mark on everything. They hit the mark on some things, you know, the liberals and the NDP are dealing with things like, uh, well, we're going to address water. We're going to deal with the unmarked graves. Um, we're going to deal with the TRC. Uh, and, you know, the conservatives barely have anything in there. And in fact, it's a very concerning platform. But where where's the comprehensive issues on land back? Where are they going to deal with the RCMP uh, in a very significant and substantive way? Uh, none of the parties have an actual genocide plan. The NDP says they're going to implement the calls to action, but you don't really see any kind of timeline around when, how are we going to do that? What's the costing around those kinds of things? And 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 so it's it's hard to know for Indigenous peoples, those who vote, first of all, um, who to vote for. You're essentially voting for your next oppressor. And that's not really a good position for Native people to be in. No, and it's it's tricky to, I think it's difficult to take the NDP seriously on this as much as we would like to sometimes when we see things like the ongoing uh, events in Ferry Creek and elsewhere at these old growth logging blockades uh, in BC. Um, as you mentioned though, uh, there's a, it doesn't seem like there's a huge appetite for an election in this country. Um, it seems like uh, that's being reflected in the early polling that we've seen with Justin Trudeau. And we've, we, it's been very surprising that we, the way that we've seen uh, the Conservatives kind of rise in the polls, who I think felt a couple of months ago like they were pretty much dead in the water in this situation. Um, are you concerned at all about handing over power? Like we can, you know, we all know about the deficiencies of the, of the Liberal government, uh, the rhetoric, the lack of action, but are you concerned at all about the possibility of handing over power now in the middle of this global health crisis, um, housing crisis, uh, you know, environmental crisis to a conservative party who seems willing or you know willing and able to go backwards on on all of these issues. I think the word concerned would be a gross understatement in terms of the conservatives. First of all, imagine them coming to power. So they weren't supportive of all of these supports for Canadians during the COVID nineteen pandemic. They're you know they want work for benefits kind of uh supposed for you know support systems they weren't supportive of first nations getting the supports they were i mean you had lots of different conservative leaders even in the provinces saying that that was unfair um you see a really strong law and order agenda what they're calling law and order where they're going to criminalize protests they're going to cut back on the canadian human rights act so that there's more free speech um basically hate speech um I, i'm exceptionally concerned because we know what we suffered under the harper you know the 10 years of the harper agenda with legislation uh, imposed on First Nations, fast forward on extraction, and that's the conservative plan this time. And if they get into power, guess whose fault that is? That would be Trudeau. Imagine rolling the dice in the middle of a pandemic, in the middle of multiple crises in Indigenous communities, just to try to get a majority government, uh, and, and then the conservatives slip in. Imagine that would lay at the feet of Trudeau. And it really goes to show like, what kind of a leader would take that kind of a gamble? Uh, and I don't think anyone wants the Liberals to be a majority. I think the way these parties work, it's best if they're kept in minority status because then you have parties that have to work together. So NDP working with Liberals or Liberals working with NDP, that's a much better scenario than any one of them getting a majority. Because we know what happens with majority powers. They force through legislation, omnibus bills, they go ahead on this assumed mandate that they really don't have with the majority of people in this country. And for indigenous peoples, how scary, because the other thing about the conservative platform is they want to privatize reserve lands. They want to make First Nations the same as Canadians. Um, they, they literally want to review the funding that goes to First Nations, AKA cut back funds like the previous Harper government did. And what is O'Toole's commitment to reconciliation? Well, he's not even happy that the flags are at half mast. He says it's about time that they be lifted. So that's a quite a frightening scenario to have the Conservatives come to power. Yeah, even that extreme half measure is too much for Aaron O'Toole. I was going to say, if there's someone that's going to, you know, we're talking about confronting the genocidal history of this country. I'm not sure Aaron O'Toole with his John A. McDonald plushie uh, is going to be the man <laughs> to, to do that. 
Um, thank, Pam, thank you so much for taking the time today. Um, it was a pleasure to have you on to this inaugural broadcast. Very exciting to have you. Uh, thank you. We appreciate it a lot. Well, thanks. And I can't wait to join you again for more election commentary. Okay, so we'll talk to you soon. And now I'm here with Martin Lukacs. He's a writer, the author of The Trudeau Formula. He is an editor at The Breach. Martin, welcome. It's great to have you in the studio. How's it going? Awesome to be here. Um, Martin, let's get to the question on everyone's mind. What are we doing here right now, Martin? Why are we having an election? I, I, I don't know. I don't have the answer for this. No one in the campaign and any of the political parties really has an answer for this. The liberals don't seem to have an answer for it. Can you explain this to me, Martin? Why, why are we having an election right now? I think it's a question the liberals are dying to have an answer for, but they really haven't been able to work anything out. Yeah. Ideally, they could have had that answer before calling the election, you, you would you, think. You but think. Yeah, that's, unfortunately, that's not what we're dealing with. Um, and we have a, okay, so we have a um, article here we want to call up, and there's a really, really revealing quote in this article. I'm going to read it out so everyone can, can hear it. Here we go. It's, it's really, un, this is kind of one of these quiet part out loud moments um, for the liberals. Uh, and they say, the lack of the big new thing is clearly something that worries the campaign. A senior liberal source told Radio Canada that Trudeau is consulting candidates looking for big ideas with a wow factor. There is concern that progressive voters aren't motivated or that their support is too dispersed. And here's the, here's the money quote here. You have to give them a reason to go out and vote and not vote for the NDP, the senior liberal source told uh, Radio Canada. Yeah, I mean, they're always looking to steal the lunch of the NDP. That's yes. kind of like the essence of the liberal formula, but also big shiny things like Trudeau, of course, himself was one back in 2015. Sure. And and like it's it's such a it's such an essential part of their formula to give people the sense that um, big shiny things, big transformative change is coming. They were so good at doing that in 2015, a little bit less so in 2019. But that formula seems to kind of be running its course now. Yeah, well, it has diminishing returns when they've been in power now for years, and a lot of these big bold ideas that they campaigned on, such as electoral reform, have just failed to materialize. So it's becoming harder and harder for them to convince people that they actually mean what they say when they do make these kind of big promises, right? Totally. And I mean, I think they know the liberals are better than anyone at kind of reading the temperature in the room. Um, and they know that broad majorities in the country want transformative change, uh, want radical policies, um, especially in light of the pandemic and all the inequalities it's revealed in our society. Um, and the best they seem to be able to do is just recycle policies that they uh, announced in 20, 2015 or 2019 and then didn't implement. Like yeah. Pharmacare, they announced on the fly in 2019. Trudeau a few days ago said he's still for Pharmacare. They had six years to do something about it, but they've just capitulated to Big Pharma and not done anything about yeah. it. Or I mean, they've been talking about universal childcare or daycare for decades, literally. It's been not, not even just the last five years, but literally decades they've been making these kinds of promises, right? That is the concession that they seem to be, to the NDP, to the feminist movement that's been demanding it for 50 years, 20, 20 years of which they've promised it. Um, and, uh, but apart from that, they don't really seem to um, have that kind of bold, um, that bold, like, changey, hopey, changey stuff sure, to run yeah. on, you know? Um, yeah. And it seems clear, like, in the energy and the tone of the campaign, like yesterday during the debate, Trudeau, really didn't have that uh, kind of magical thing about him. Sure. Uh, he was losing his cool, shouting at the other um, party leaders. So um, he, he he doesn't really seem to have that uh, je ne sais quoi that he's so good at Sure, having. yeah, yeah. He's kind of off his game. Um, what do you make of the first couple of weeks uh, of this election season, which have been really surprising, I think, in terms of the shifting polling that we've seen? Obviously, I think we can we can it feels like if the Liberals called this election, it means they had some pretty good internal polling numbers. They felt pretty confident that they could turn this into a new majority. Otherwise, we wouldn't be having this election. We all, that's the unspoken reason. We all know that that's the reason they're calling the election in the first place. Um, so what do you make about these first few weeks with the Conservative Party climbing in the polls? Aaron O'Toole, who seemed like kind of dead in the water just a couple weeks ago, is now, I don't know, approaching frontrunner status pop possibly. Are you convinced by this movement yet, or is this a mirage that we're seeing in the early days of this kind of horse race coverage of the, of the election? I don't think it's a mirage. Um, the major dynamic that we've seen in the election has been uh, liberal voters peeling off to the conservative camp. Um, mm. And I think uh, you have to hand it to O'Toole. Like he has done, in a matter of weeks, 
done a really incredible job at persuading a lot of Canadians that the Conservative Party is not a goblin army of misogynist bigots and climate deniers that like emerged fully formed out of the tar pits in uh, the Alberta tar sands. <laughs> sure. You know, um, and like that, um, in some ways, actually, I think what um, O'Toole has achieved is kind of outdoing Trudeau at the Trudeau formula that he so sure. effectively executed in 2015. Like he is managing to be all things to everyone. Um, sure. And now you see them kind of trying to make appeals to Trudeau's left and trying to make themselves look like the sort of party that working people can can look to in this election. They've come up with this idea of, of putting a, a worker on the boards of major companies, which I'm not really sold on. I don't really believe that in practice that would actually look the way that it's being described. But it, it is part of an effort on their part to at least make these overtures to these these constituencies that they weren't really doing before. Yeah, I think I think he is running a very effective campaign tacking to the center. Um, and I think it, it's more all the more remarkable when you consider his evolution as a conservative uh, MP and a conservative uh, candidate for leader. Like when he first ran for leadership in 2017, he ran as a moderate and lost. And then interestingly, he reinvented himself as a much more hard right leader um, he made a compact with social conservatives, you know, he beat his chest about taking back Canada and he beat out Maxime Bernier for the leadership. And interestingly, now he's gone through a third evolution. Yeah. Um, he's a man of many qualities, <laughs> uh, clearly. And he, um, you know, he's come back now pro-choice, pro-abortion. He supposedly is now an advocate for LGBTQ rights as well. Um, in his latest videos, he's even talking about mental health supports for Canadians. Like, could you ever have imagined someone like Stephen Harper talking about mental health supports? Yeah. I mean, I guess the, I guess the question is, are, are you convinced by this tack to the center? Or to, you know, are the conservatives really legitimate in their willingness to, I think, speak to these people? Again, you have a whole sort of a darker element of the conservative constituency showing up outside of Trudeau events um, right now. Uh, this kind of like more far right uh, element that's kind of been bubbling up under the surface, which can, like historically the Conservative Party and Aaron O'Toole himself has been more than willing to kind of play footsie with and, and dog whistle to. So are you convinced that this move to the center is legitimate or is this just a kind of uh, cynical election ploy by, the, by O'Toole? Oh, it's entirely cynical, but I think the O'Toole and his strategists know that they have their solid base locked down. Like, where else are they going to go? I don't think they're as worried that they're going to go to the People's Party now. Yeah, I don't think they are. And, and, you know, they're talking about things like, you know, not even balancing the budget, right, for 10 years. But I think if we elect them and give them a majority, we're going to see the most savage austerity that we've seen in this country in a generation. Um, I wanted to talk about this Willy Wonka ad, too. This is kind of a, a ridiculous a, attempted viral moment by the Conservatives. Uh, it came across as pretty phony to me. It was kind of a how do you do fellow kids moment uh, for Aaron O'Toole. Uh, what, was, what was behind the, the thinking of this, this very silly uh, attempt to go viral with this Willy Wonka ad? Well, let's, let's play the clip. Okay, let's play, bring up the clip. Here we go again. Daddy will get you a golden goose as soon as we get home. No, I want one of those. I want a party with roomfuls of laughter. 10,000 tons of ice cream! I want the works, I want the whole works. Presents and prizes and sweets and surprises of all shapes and sizes. And now, don't care how I want the majority. Yeah, um, I don't know. I don't know about the Willy Wonka ad, Martin. It well, didn't, really, I, I mean, didn't I, have an effect on me. I confess I kind of liked it, but it might just be because I'm basically a boomer. Yeah, uh, yeah. But, but not the reasons that they intended, I guess. No, but here's the thing. is like I watched like so many leftists and liberals like, you know, making fun of it. It's clearly a ploy by two very savvy right-wing st digital strategists that the Tories have imported from New Zealand. Um, they helped elect a right-wing government in Australia. They helped elect Boris Johnson in the UK. And they specifically talk about putting out deliberately lame memes, boomer memes, as they call them. That sounds like foreign election interference that we're <laughs> dealing with here. It's frightening. I mean, it is more or less, but, <laughs> but, but the whole this point... This is okay, though. Yeah. I mean, the whole point is to just drive interactions, right? Yeah. And um, that, that, that video, before it got um, to, removed from Twitter, had almost like 2 million views. Yeah. And the whole point is to juice the algorithm 
so that their future posts, which are entirely serious, as we've seen from them, just get way more reach. Yeah. And uh, I think that the, a lot of the, the Tory content has been getting even wider circulation than Liberals. Uh, liberals as content. And the second thing is, is that I think it's, it's also accomplished something that is a pretty familiar tool in the kind of right-wing populist playbook, which is that by attracting the contempt of kind of like the liberal media elite, what they're doing is reminding a lot of working class voters of... They play up that every man. Yeah, and of the contempt... This is what they think of you. Yeah, and of the contempt that, um, you know, they experienced at the hands of their bosses or their teachers or other people. Mm -hmm. So I think while you know, us effet liberal cosmopolitan intellectuals like laugh at it, it's actually doing them a service. So yeah. we have to be really careful about that, I think. Yeah. Um, I guess the, the next thing I wanted to get to, Martin, this is the, the conversation that comes up around every election season. It's the thing that we're all just talking about, which is, uh, you know, what the NDP's role here is, what, you know, whether their platform goes far enough and really uh, speaks to the people that really are feeling the sense that you know, we're confronting all these very serious crises. Are they going far enough? Are, do we think they're being bold enough in their vision of this? Um, are they just content to be sort of a, a slightly more progressive or slightly more social democratic version of the Liberal Party? This is the question, we ha the, the, the conversations that we have time and time again. Um, so on that level, like, how do you think that they're performing so far just in terms of their, their election campaign? It's, I feel like the, the political moment for the NDP and how they're confronting it is kind of fraught with contradictions. Um, so on one hand, like the platform that they put out is indisputably the most progressive that they put out in a generation. Um, there are things in there that um, are clearly responding to the kind of uh, moment that we're in and the rise of kind of insurgent democratic socialist challenges in the United States and in the UK. Um, you know, there's talk of, you know, new crown corporations for providing telecom services, there's um, public inner city buses, there's uh, community owned renewable energy, um, especially when it comes to the climate crisis, they, they have put things into the platform that I certainly didn't expect them to do. Um, and, you know, also as well, the wealth taxes, the suite of policies around increasing taxation on corporations and the wealthiest, uh, including windfall pandemic profits, is something that deeply resonates with Canadians. I mean, 90% of Canadians want to see wealth taxation. Yeah, I mean, this is something that I, that I spoke to you about it around the last election cycle, I remember, um, which is that, you know, I've certainly been critical of the NDP and, and their, their unwillingness, I think, to really meet, meet these kind of moments with really bold vision, but to their credit, they did propose this wealth tax and tried to kind of initiate this scenario where they kind of forced forced uh, others in parliament, other parties in parliament to vote against it. Um, as you pointed out, I think this is something that we don't talk about enough, which is that this is incredibly popular. The level of, of support uh, in the broad Canadian public that has for these, these significant wealth taxes. So to their credit, that is something that they've uh, centered uh, in, over the last couple of years and that they're hopefully centering in this election campaign. Yeah, and they, in fact, they've, they've made it one of their key ads in Quebec. Um, let's take a look at it. Les milliardaires ont fait des profits records pendant la crise, mais Justin Trudeau n'a pas le courage de les faire payer. Avec l'NPD, les autres riches vont faire leur part pour relancer le Canada. Faut juste oser. I mean, I, I, I don't know why they're not playing those kinds of ads in English Canada. I mean, it has a kind of like particular cultural inflection that is more Québécois for sure, yeah. but there's no reason that um, those kinds of ads aren't being played across the country. So there's a way in which, like, while while their platform is more, more solid than it's ever been, it's not really coming through in the campaigning. I guess that's the tricky thing as well. We've talked about the, the sort of split between the federal NDP party, and then you see their actions provincially in places like Alberta and BC. Don't instill me with a ton of confidence that if they are given this kind of mandate, that they're willing to do what needs to be done. Um, and that's always kind of, that's kind of the central question when it comes to the NDP. And that's the central question right now. And it's definitely hamstrung them in this election as well. So, for instance, while the policies in the platform are really actually quite consequential when it comes to climate justice, on the campaign trail, Jagmeet Singh has yet again started to waver on one of the central issues for the environmental justice movement in the country, which is the question of pipelines. Um, on the Trans Mountain Pipeline, which is trampling indigenous rights, going to be massively expanding the, the exportation of uh, tar sands from Alberta. He has yet again um, 
kind of return to the mushy middle. So he, 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 in, in clips just in the last few days, he's been challenged on the issue. And he said, yes, I've always um, uh, opposed it, which is also not true at the very beginning. <laughs> yeah. He had to be pushed really hard. But even now, he's saying, yes, I always, I've always been opposed. The money would be better spent elsewhere. And yet, if I become prime minister, I'm going to study the asset and see what to do about mm. it. It's a simple, it's a simple, no, we're going to scrap yeah. the project. How hard has this is how hard what that been? You know? Exactly. And as you pointed out, the last time we spoke about this in the last election, 18 months ago, as depressing as that is, um, that was one of the central reasons for their downfall in Quebec, which is the main reason of uh, the reason that they had a disappointing result in the last election, because these pipelines are very unpopular here. And their kind of unwillingness to take this kind of a bold stand on this has hurt them here in Quebec is for a lot of people here want the NDP to completely move, disinvest themselves from these projects and forcefully move away from them. And it's just this unwillingness to do this. Again, it just speaks to the, it's hard to take the NDP seriously on the climate crisis when they're not willing to take these kind of stances. Okay, so now we're here with Riley Yesno, um, Anishinaabe writer, researcher, public speaker, Riley. Thanks for joining us on the inaugural uh, our broadcast here. How's it going? Good. Thanks for having me. Very exciting. It is exciting, isn't it? I'm very excited. Um, okay, Riley. So really the, the story that's been dominating the headlines lately, not just in Canada and the U.S., but internationally, is the withdrawal from Afghanistan. The U.S. has finally ended this 20-year occupation. And um, it's been a very strange reaction, I think, from the media class, both here and elsewhere, who have taken this very personally and have this very strong reaction to this to this this occupation finally coming to an end. Um, what is your takeaway from this? Like, how do you how are you feeling witnessing the end of this this 20 year uh, occupation of Afghanistan and also the the kind of bizarre uh, reaction that we've seen to it from the media class? I'm wondering if also it's uh, just because it's around election time that we're talking about it more, or if we're also seeing like an uptick in people's care about international affairs. Like I'm thinking about earlier this year, or early last year, remember when like Palestine, Israel, Palestine was like a huge conversation in the news that it had not been for a really long time, despite, you know, the, the huge occupation happening there for forever. So I'm, I'm still also analyzing and trying to see what this is means for like the Canadian public. But it's important because it also is actually manifest in, in like policy change, right? Like the Liberals just released their platform and they promised to double um, the number of, of Afghan refugees and asylum seekers that will accept into Canada, which is all, which is still a, an absurdly and like, you know, horrifically low number, um, considering especially Canada's role in this like, you know, imperial occupation. Um, but I think, uh, yeah, it's it's been uh, a ride. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you touched on something really interesting, which is that I think the, it's part of this myth that we tell ourselves in this country about Canadian foreign policy that it is more benign than our U.S. counterparts, and that we are this this global force for good. I mean, these are things that we we tell ourselves. Um, and then when we, you mentioned the the violence in Israel Palestine from a few months ago, when we we are able to see that play out, and we understand that our role in allowing that kind of violence and dispossession to continue, it kind of punctures holes in this narrative that we've constructed about this. And Afghanistan is a similar is a similar uh, story, right? Um, we can kind of distance ourselves a little bit from the from the United States and kind of position ourselves as being in Afghanistan um, previously in order to advance human rights and to do these good things while ignoring some of the brutalities that Canadians were involved with in this occupation, um, you know, uh, knowingly handing over prisoners to be tortured and things like this. This is very serious, um, you know, criminal behavior that we that we took part in in this occupation, which has just been not at all part of the dialogue that we've had about about this about the, the endless occupation in Afghanistan. We've completely swept all this stuff under the rug. Yeah, like, you know, maybe we can have more critical conversations branching off of this about like, you know, the arms deals in Saudi Arabia and, and just all of these other really important policy points too. It would be nice if we did have a conversation about that. That's if we want to pretend to be a force for human rights in the world, we won't have any credibility when we make these kind of claims. Uh, we should probably stop arming and funding these genocidal regimes. Um, that would be a good place to start. Um, which for some reason is like a controversial, that's like a controversial thing to talk about in our media, but I don't think it should be. Um, yeah. I, and so another thing you're pointing out as well is that I think, you know, um, there's a whole generation now, a younger generation of Canadians that are sort of starting to try to pay more attention to this stuff uh, that's becoming more politically active, politically aware. 
and are looking around at the political landscape here and elsewhere and are kind of alarmed by a lot of the things that are on the horizon, the climate crisis, the housing crisis, the crisis in indigenous communities. Um, there's a never ending list of various crises that we're all kind of looking around and realizing that our ruling class hasn't really had the answers uh, to any of these, any of these uh, issues. Um, so how do you feel about going into this election? Like, do you think the interests of the younger generation, the people that have to kind of take, are eventually going to, you know, rise to take over uh, and, and, you know, be a major part of society? Are these things being addressed properly? Uh, or are, is our ruling class still, I mean, I feel like I'm setting you up for you. I think I know what the answer is going to be, but what do you think? Is our ruling class taking these issues seriously enough or are, is it just a lot of rhetoric and, and not a lot of action? Yeah, yeah. Short answer, no. <laughs> short, short answer, yeah. no, they're not, you know, doing it. I think, though, like, the youth vote in this election is something I think is really interesting, right? Because, like, in the 2015 Trudeau election, it was very, like, big news that he had captured the young voters and brought them out in droves like we had never seen before in an election. And now, seven years later, we're looking at early polls, and it's, like, completely flipped from him, where, like, the NDP are now polling as the favorite party, double digits ahead of the liberals. Um, and so we're seeing how, you know, that millennial late or early Gen Z generation, you know, in 2015 to 2021, like experienced just the profound failures and and promise breaking and all of these things of the liberal government. Um, and now are, are looking uh, to more progressive and to more uh, left options. That said, though, like, I don't think any of the parties have like truly understood um, what it means to capture the youth vote in a meaningful way. Like, I think that there's a lot of just now they're like, oh, you know, like, I'll go on TikTok <laughs> and yeah. then do whatever <laughs> and, and do like lame lame TikToks and stuff as opposed to actually making policy that would like advance and help young people and actually inspire them to get out to the polls. And so I'm thinking about things like housing certainly is one of them, uh, but also like post-secondary. The conservatives have absolutely nothing in their platform for post-secondary commitments. Big shock. Um, the uh, liberals uh, are going to eliminate interest on student loans and they talk about eliminating up to $3,000 per person um, as being like this big, huge thing. I'm like, you clearly don't have student loans any of you because <laughs> three grand is like nothing compared to the debt people are carrying our generation is carrying and then the NDP have you know perhaps the most robust and most solid uh, policies for post-secondary education eliminating interest debt up to twenty thousand dollars or something like that but it's still like you know I think the main thing being that public educate that post-secondary education should be publicly funded that nobody should have crushing debt especially if you're going to posture as a party that champions affordability um, and a party that cares about young people and so I think we still have a long long way to go yeah I mean you you hit it there I mean obviously the NDP and Jungmeet Singh have made outreach to young people but the question is going to be like whether it's whether this outreach is going to consist of TikToks or really meaningfully uh, you know committing to direct action to confront these very serious crises I think that's the problem I have with the NDP and really everyone in this election is that none of these crises for young people or anywhere else is really being addressed with the seriousness that it needs to be. Mm -hmm. um, and that includes LGBTQ issues, right? I mean, uh, this is something that I think, again, with Trudeau, we've seen him do a lot of, say a lot of nice things about the LGBTQ community. He's marched in the pride parades. We've all seen the socks, the rainbow socks. <laughs> you know, that's great. But what is Trudeau offering to, to these communities? And what is what are the other parties actually offering to, to you know, improve this, improve uh, material conditions for, uh, LGBTQ youth and, and the entire LGBTQ community. Yeah, yeah. I mean, similar with the youth conversation, I think in terms of LGBTQ issues, the NDP probably have the most solid platform, but it's still lacking in, in so many areas. And I think that like, you know, there's a couple key points in LGBTQ discourse, policy discourse, that the parties like are sure to talk about. So like something like uh, the blood ban um, and something like conversion therapy. And so all of the parties have banning conversion therapy in their platform. The conservatives, though, notably exclude in their language um, a gender minority so you know they are okay with banning it for gay people but not necessarily trans people is what that language says which is something really frightening and startling um, but the ND uh, but the liberals sorry 
they have uh, abandoned their 2015 original promise to end the blood ban. Uh, they have nothing in their platform for LGBTQ refugees, even though there are still seven countries globally and 77 countries globally that criminalize um, uh, LGBTQ same-sex relationships to some degree. Um, and so the liberals love to posture. And this is like, I think LGBTQ is one of the points, especially where the liberals can like really say, but look, he was the first prime ministers to march in a pride parade. He has his rainbow socks. And that's why we are the leaders and the global champions of LGBTQ issues. It's but a like, selection. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Once you look at it, like with even just a little bit of critical thought, like and a little bit of, you know, interrogation, you see how quickly um, all of that crumbles and that we need to be talking about more things like no party is talking about like medically invasive and abusive surgeries on intersex children. Um, nobody is talking about um, a mental health care for LGBTQ people. There's once again, like, a really, really long way to go in this policy area. Yes, yeah, this and every single other area. But uh, I really appreciate your, your input on this. We're looking forward to doing more coverage with you on, as the election progresses. Uh, Riley, thanks so much for joining us uh, on this in inaugural broadcast. Great to have you. Thanks, Rob. All right, take care. Well, that's the end of the, the inaugural edition of our somewhat experimental uh, election coverage here at The Breach. We're going to be coming back live uh, the night of the debate on September 9th, followed by the election itself. September 20th. If you want to tune into those broadcasts, you can do so on YouTube. So please subscribe to The Breach's YouTube page. The Breach is a member-supported independent media institution. We're really excited to be covering this election. And so until next time, uh, this is Rob Rousseau, and um, we'll talk to you soon.